We're going to finish uh, chapter <clears throat> 10 this morning, so uh, if you will, turn there with me. And uh, we've been in chapter 10 for quite a while. My hope is, my prayer is, whether you've been here through the entire time as we work through the book of Hebrews, or if you're just popped in today, that God will give you just what you need in your life. I'm so thankful for every single one of you that have come this morning. You obviously said this is the priority of my life today and this morning. I want to be here and I want to worship the Lord. I want to be with um, the community of faith. And you'd rather be here, obviously, than you would anywhere else. I, and I commend you on that. I want you to know that um, um, to, to reassure you that every single person here is um, God is aware of your presence this morning. He is aware of your person. God knows about what you're going through in your life, and He loves you very much. He cares about you, and He wants to minister to you this morning. And that's what we want to allow the Lord to do. We want, to allow, we want the Lord to feel free uh, to work with all of us. Because we all come to the same place. We all come to the cross. Now, having commend all of you for coming this morning, there's one special lady I, as I was sitting here on the platform thinking about, I really wanted to commend her in front of all of you. As much effort, effort as it takes all of us to get here, uh, there's another lady here uh, by the name of Addie Lee Wall. And I would like for Miss Addie Lee to stand up so everybody could see her. Miss Addie Lee, would you just stand up for a moment? Just stand up so we can see you. Miss Wall is in her mid-90s, and she rarely misses church on Sunday. There she is. And she still mows her own grass. So she's quite a lady, and, and she's been here for a while. And she gave me some history on Floorsville one time when the blacksmith was down the corner uh, before they had cars and all of that kind of thing. So we went way back, and it was, it was really interesting. But I'm so thankful for, um, for the church because the church represents uh, not just the young, but all the way from the young to the elderly. And we're all uh, a family. We're all brothers and sisters. And so we want to really help each other. And it was God's plan for this uh, to be the case. And I was just thinking this morning, you know, even when I was coming up here for church, I was thinking, you know, I bet we have some ladies here who up in their years and have lost their husbands. And they feel so confident and secure here because I, I, I bet we have some ladies who feel like, you know, if I need somebody to help me, I know that I can count on somebody down there at First Baptist Church. And that's the way it ought to be. We ought to be taking care of each other and helping each other. And, and, we, and we do do that. There are so many of the men who uh, are helping uh, with so many of the widows and, and folks who just have needs in their lives. And we're all like that. We're all needy people. And we need each other, and most particularly, we need the Lord. I needed this next text because the last text about kill me in chapter 10, it was one of the most difficult sermons I've ever preached in 23 years of preaching. It was, and some of you said, well, it wasn't so difficult for me when I was listening to you. I said, yeah, but I had to start from scratch, from nothing, and get to where I've got to communicate it to you in a way that you can go, gosh, this is going to help me. And that's not the easiest task in the world, but that's the one the Lord's given me. But God's going to give some encouragement now. He gave a warning. This is not about salvation. This is about living in the here and now as a Christian. God wants us to be helped and to endure uh, the task that He's given us because someday, here's our title, someday promotion day is coming. It's coming. For some of us, it's maybe right around the corner. And for some of us, it's a little ways off. But we all still are here, and we've got a race to run. 
and the Lord wants us to run it well. So he, he gives some, some encouraging words. He gives a remedy for being able to cross the finish line the way the Lord wants you to. Not talking about whether you're going to heaven or hell. You know, you're, you're going to heaven. You have your citizenship in heaven when you ask the Lord to come into your life. John said, to as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become the children of God. Wrote that in the first century. Way before there were Baptists or Presbyterians or Catholics or any of those folks. Received him. Christianity is not about a religion, it's about a person. It's about a relationship with a living person. His name is Jesus Christ. And you meet that person and he comes into your life in a saving relationship, forgiving you for all your sins, when you say, dear Lord, I can't save myself. Lord Jesus, come into my life and save me and be my Lord and forgive me for my sins. When a person does that, right at that instant, God translates them from death to eternal life. Because eternal life exists in the Son of God, in Jesus Christ. When you have Jesus, you have, you possess eternal life. So I'm going to heaven when I die. But God has more in store for me and for you than going to heaven. He wants us to live for him in the here and now. And to do that, it's difficult, so we need some encouragement. So here's what he says, beginning in verse 32. We'll just finish it out in the chapter today. Remember those earlier days after you have received the light when you endured in a great conflict full of suffering. So one of the things he's going to tell these guys, you know, these Jewish Christians is remember, sometimes you were publicly exposed to insult and to insult and persecution. At other times you stood side by side. In other words, they had solidarity with those who were so treated. You suffered along with those in prison and joyfully accepted the confiscation of your property because you knew that you yourselves had better and lasting possessions. So don't throw away your confidence. You're not saying don't throw away your salvation, but don't throw away your confidence because it will be richly rewarded. You need to persevere. So we need to endure. endure. So that when you have done the will of God, you will receive <clears throat> what he has promised. For in just a little while, he who is coming will come. This is at Habakkuk chapter 2. And will not delay. And, but my righteousness one will live by faith. My righteous one will live by faith. And I take no pleasure in the one who shrinks back. But we do not belong to those who shrink back and are destroyed, but to those who have faith and are saved. So he wants us to remember the past. This is going to be an antidote to help us finish the, uh, the finish line like God wants us to, to get to promotion day in the way the Lord wants us to. He wants us to resist and endure the trial or trials at hand, and he wants us to receive the promise of reward. So here's our antidote to get us there, okay? Well, what is the problem? Well, these Jewish Christians that he wrote to in the first century, when they started out, everybody starts out somewhere, right? Maybe you were eight years old when you asked the Lord to come into your life. I was 17. Um, Lady in First Baptist Smithville, when she got saved, when I was there, she was 63 years old. Gone to church all her life. So we're all at different, but everybody starts somewhere Uh, those of us who asked the Lord to come into our life. And when they started, they had tremendous confidence in the Lord. In fact, they had so much confidence that not only did they exhibit joy in being persecuted and the confiscation of their property, but they still went and showed solidarity with their brothers and sisters who were in jail and who had been persecuted, and they had received extra persecution for that. And they were ready to do it. You have to be pretty confident in the Lord to want to do that. I mean, somebody just comes and wipes you out financially, and you're going to be like um, Nehemiah 8.10 says, the joy of the Lord is my strength. 
You've got to have a lot of confidence in the Lord to do that. And they did. And so they stood toe to toe with their persecutors and chose to love them and pray for them and bless them. But something happened along the way. And when we get to this epistle that our author is writing, confidence had turned into a big question mark. What happened? Well, what happened to them happens to a lot of people today. For one of the things, time had transpired. Time and circumstance. And with and time has a way of changing things. A couple weeks ago, I hardly ever get on Facebook. Came on Sunday night, I just I got on Facebook. And immediately staring me in the face was this picture right here. This picture is a 1984, and that's me. Some of you are going, who is that? That's me. In 1984, I was baptizing at First Baptist Church in Dickinson, so I'm 26 years old. Let me tell you how time changes things. See if I can get my thing to work here. There we go. You need, now, I have to do it on both of them here. Time changes things. Do you see this right here? Do you see this right here? Right here. Let me do it for you guys over here. Right here. Right here. That's what 30 years will do to you. Now, by the way, who does that look like to you? Drew. Yeah, it looks like Drew. Now, I just got another picture that came across my path this morning. Here's another picture. Now, some of you are our guests, some of you are guests today, but Sheila, Sheila is our pianist. And this is, this is a night, the picture I showed you is in 1984. This is 1984 when Sheila and Ronald got married. Now, I want you to notice something. Time changes things for some of us. You see this woman right here? No difference, right here and right here. But what is this? And this, <laughs> that's 30 years. <laughs> now, I say all that to say that we could have brought your picture up, right? But I'm just telling you, you're going to want to hold on. Promotion. You're going to want to hold on to your confidence because Prado Prado promotion day is coming. Now listen, I, this is just my theory, okay? I believe that when we get to heaven and God gives us our new body, what we're going to look like when we get to heaven, uh-oh, where'd my picture go? Is, is, uh, if I can get this thing to work here, huh? Yeah, is not this but this, is that a good deal? Yeah. Sheila, is that a good deal? Absolutely. <laughs> In other words, you know, when Adam and Eve was created, they were created, man, they didn't have, they weren't elderly. They were in their prime time of life. And that's the way I believe we're going to look when we get to heaven. That's why you want to hang on. Well, you know, we're going there one way or the other when we ask the Lord to come into our life. But we want, to, we want to get there, we want to go there in a way in which we please the Lord. Now that's why, one of the reasons why we've come to church this morning, because we want to learn how to grow in the Lord. Remember, uh, way back there in uh, chapter 2 in our, in our epistle, the first warning was given to these Jewish Christians, and he said, listen guys, don't drift away. Remember, uh, that was a nautical term. And it was the term, it was the thought of a, a ship that was moored to the dock. 
And somehow or another, the, the rope that had moored the ship became uh, uh, loose and then unraveled. And so the ship didn't, didn't, didn't go away. It didn't drift away because a hurricane gale wind came in, but just a slow little current. And it just took that little boat away down the river, away from where it needed to be docked. And our author was saying, don't let that happen to you. Well, that's exactly over time and circumstance what had happened to our readers. This is why they didn't have the confidence that they once had. Why? What happened? What were the circumstances? There were many, I'm sure. One of them was probably disappointment. You know, when you start out with the Lord, you have all these hopes and dreams, don't you? And not only for yourself, but for who? Your kids. Sometimes you have these for your parents. One out of two people end up in divorce today. How many kids right now are saying, oh, I wish my mom and dad would get back together? And they're so disappointed. And sometimes the disappointments we have are not just about others, they're about ourselves. And sometimes we have trouble getting over that and through it. Sometimes it's sorrow. Sometimes uh, it's a loss in our life. And some people get so overwhelmed with those things that they drift away and they discontinue trusting the Lord in their lives. Well, what does our author say we should do? He says, here's what you need to do to get the question mark out of your life. You need to go back and remember the past. What past? Remember how God worked in your life. You know, why do you think God instituted the Passover? And better than that, in the New Testament, why do you think he uh, instituted the Lord's Supper? So that we could go back and remember what God has done and how great he is. The Bible says there's nothing too hard for the Lord. All things are possible with God. And yes, we do have disappointments in our life. And we do have things in our lives in our past that we cannot go back and change. And we have failures and we have sins that we have that we remember. But listen, here's what you must do in remembering your past. In order to gain confidence with the Lord, in order to endure, you must treat yourself the way God treats yourself. You must think about yourself the way God thinks about yourself. What does God say he's going to do with all your sins? He's going to place them as far as the east is from the west. That's, that's forever gone. He, is, he says in his memory banks, he is going to remember not one of them ever again. When you go to the judgment seat of Christ, that's for all Christians, your life not your soul, but your life, what you did for the Lord or what you didn't do for the Lord is going to be thrown into the fire. What's going to come out of the fire is what you did for the Lord by faith because God wants to reward you for that. That's why he wants you to endure. That's why he wants you to finish this race in the way that he is so designed. But what's not going to make it out of the fire? Anything that's not of the Lord. Any sin, any failure, any, all that bad stuff. Thank God. The book of Hebrews in chapter 12 says, for our God is a God who is a consuming fire. He is going to consume every bad thing in your life, and it's not going to make it on the other side of heaven. And your sins will never be, well, you need to start treating yourself the same way God treats you. God has forgiven me for that. You remember what Paul said in Philippians chapter 3, he says, forgetting those things behind. Wait a minute, I thought I'm supposed to remember the past. You forget what God forgets. You remember what God wants you to remember. What God wants you to forget are those things that he's forgotten. He's forgotten your sins. 
What he wants you to remember is what he's done, how he took Israel all through the Red Sea and delivered them into the promised land. He made a promise because he's faithful and the promise that he made to them, he made to you in the new covenant. This gives you confidence so that you won't drift away. And so that you can, secondly, so that you can endure. God wants you to endure. Listen to this. I I, I found this little illustration. It was just a, a lot of fun. During his time as the U.S. Division Director of Wycliffe Bible Translators, Bernie May used to write a column in the ministry's newsletter. He once wrote about Ken and Neve Shoemaker of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, who were supporters and at that time in their 80s. Quote, we're on our last lap, Ken told Bernie on the phone, but we're committed to spend three hours a day in prayer mostly for the Wycliffe people. The Wycliffe people will go into an unreached people group where they have no Bible, they don't know about Jesus, and they will live there and learn the alphabet, then they will learn the language, then they will be able to translate the Bible into their language, that's what they do. Then missionaries will be able to come in and reach the people with the scriptures. The other day, Neve, his wife, Ken's wife, was awfully tired. She said she didn't know whether she was able to pray the full three hours. I told her, come on, come on, Neve, don't let up. We've got to finish the course. That day, Ken and Neve prayed not three hours, but three and a half hours. You see, that's endurance. The only way we're going to be able to endure is if we have confidence. And where do we get confidence? We remember what God has done. That's why we read the scriptures, because we remember what the Lord has done. And we remember what he's done in our own lives. We remember the prayers that he's answered in our own lives, the problems he's solved in our own lives, the love that he has placed in our own hearts. This helps us to stay steady at the wheel so that, finally, we'll be able to receive the promise. We'll be able to receive the reward because God wants to reward the faithful. There is no reward for those who quit. Do you know what patience means? You know, I always thought I knew what that meant until this week, and I did a little word study. The word patience means to stay under the trial. It means to stay there. So many Christians today, they want to exit as soon as the heat gets turned up. They think God is wherever the heat is not. That's not necessarily true. Many times, God is the one turning the fire up in order to develop patience. So many people, when, the, when, the, when it gets tough, they want to leave. And so they miss out on the lesson and the character trait that God wants to build in their lives. So God wants us to endure, and we can endure when we remember. This will help us receive the reward. And uh, lastly, there was one little illustration I found that I really like. Because I, you know, I I grew up, I was a city boy, I wasn't a farmer. And, um, but this is a a farmer story. R.A. Torrey told this this, uh, particular story in one of his sermons. He said, my wife's aunt, Gladys has always had a little apple orchard at her home. But this year, when we paid her a visit, I couldn't help but notice the huge harvest of apples. The branches hung heavy and some were cracking with the weight of abundance. Never in many years had anyone seen such a harvest. When I asked her why, she told me that last year there was a late frost in the spring and all the buds froze. When that happens, Gladys said, An apple tree does a miraculous thing. It stores up its energy in thousands of little bumps 
or nodules. And all that energy pulsates through that ne network of nodules until the spring of the following year, and then bam, you have an exploding riot of buds as an apple tree unleashes all that stored up energy. Gladys' description made me think about our spiritual lives. Sometimes the harsh frost of this life, disappointments, sorrow, hopes and dreams gone awry, hurt, pain, and loss cause our hearts to freeze. But at the core of the Christian faith, we also live with an incredible promise. In and through Christ, there will be an abundant harvest in our lives. God's power is pulsating under the gnarly bark of this world and even our bodies. In Christ, we are being formed into a small nodule of living hope. And during certain seasons of our life, we feel our hearts waiting and longing and even aching for those frozen places to burst into life. Our living hope is that one day, all of this stored up glory will be unleashed in a joyful riot of splendor. I think that's what our author is telling his original audience. Don't drift away. Stay in there. Remember what God has done. Endure. Because the reward's coming. Promotion day is coming. 